Samuel begin in Ezekiel chapter 37 when we get going, verse 1 through 12. Kim. Your hair is a little whiter than Sam's. Yeah, okay. That's, that is Kim up there. All I saw was a you know, silhouette. Kim, how are you doing? You seem to be my best bud when it comes to this. <laughs> He's looking at me going, if you don't get my name right, uh, we may be in Jeremiah. <laughs> uh, thanks for, for pulling like that. Isn't it? You know, there's something about what's coming is that it's going to come from within by the glory of God breaking forth. And each of us are carriers of so much. You carry so much. We carry collectively so much. And it's so, so um, unlocking that truth and connecting to that place then opens the door for all the, all the other things to follow up suit, including the prosperity and our, well, and our health. Amen? So um, Ezekiel 47, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit again some more. And... Partly just because I really believe he's really chosen per the Father's direction and Jesus' request to really begin a, a, fre- a, new, a new manifestation of himself in our midst from within out, uh, a, a deep renewal. And I don't know about you, but I'm first in line, right? I'm not... It's funny because a lot of times when we come to those moments where the Lord says, hey, I'd like to come, I need to come, you need me to come, I want to come, I've got such things I want to get done, and he starts to flow. I'm going to share on um, Sunday the the story of what the Holy Spirit did in the first six chapters of the Bible, and it's pretty crazy if you just pause the first six chapters of the book of Acts, just the way he just exploded. And we, in two weeks from now, we're going to start... The triumphant voice, which we are intentionally trying to individually awaken the voice of God within, become aware, give place, give voice, agree, so that the voice of God in the midst of us can rise up and the voice of Jesus over us can begin singing and the sound that heaven wants to bring to us can begin to break out and all of us can come to a new place. That's our goal. And I hope you will set aside all three evenings, no daytime meetings, just Wednesday the 16th, 17th, Thursday night, and Friday night the 18th. And seven to nine or so, all three nights. And we're just here to allow his triumphant voice to rise up in us. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 2, excuse me, that in any situation, in all situations, we are always being led in triumph. So... We don't need to change our life to get a good sound. We just need to get the good sound to change our life. So that's the intent, and that's what we're doing. But when we step toward that, it's not surprising that you might feel like, wow, that's like the opposite. You know, it's like if you're preparing for a triumphant voice conference, you probably feel like I feel like a squeaky mouse myself in where I'm at. If you're preparing for a healing conference, all of a sudden you feel like you're getting sick. You're preparing for a prosperity conference and the washer breaks down because there's that opposition to try to just kind of displace us from the, 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 the word of the Lord and the, in, and the unseen and try to get us onto the scene and to the situation as it's describing itself to us. And that's why that, that's the warfare. So to stir us up and to engage and to press and allow the river to flow is, is a good exercise. It's not to, to do for the Holy Spirit, it's just to kind of surrender and submit and yield and hope for a greater manifestation than what we've known before. Does that follow me on that? So Ezekiel 47, as the great water scripture, which is also Revelation 22, and Jesus refers to the river of life as the Holy Spirit in John 7. So Ezekiel 47 is the picture of the river of life coming out from the temple. John, Revelation 22 is the picture of the river of life coming out from the throne of God. And John 7 is Jesus in the tabernacle, in the temple, saying that uh, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. He who believes out of his belly or his innermost being will flow the river of living water. 
So in a sense, we are, have the potential of a massive river flowing out of our belly as likened to what Ezekiel 47 shows and Revelation 22. So look at this. It says, he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced the east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. And the man went out to the east with the line in his hand and he measured 1,000 cubics and he brought me through the waters and the waters came up to my ankles. We'll pause right there. So the temple is from the altar. There's a bit of water coming out. It doesn't seem like it's a, you know, a massive, mighty river. It's just the water coming out from the... It's, an, it's not so much that it's just coming out from the front of the altar. It's coming from the south side of the front of the altar. So it's just an just image. You know, it's a leaky faucet. It's just water. But it, as it goes out the gate, he's now brought around the outside from the north, and he comes, and the angel takes a line, and he goes following that water eastward a thousand cubics which would be about 1500 feet so that's a pretty you know that's that's what's um 500 yards it's it's a bit of a distance and then when they get there it says he brought me through and the word through in all the hebrew is cross so picture you're with the angel and you're ezekiel and you walking through down along the bank of the this water and that you get a thousand fifteen hundred feet down the down the river he then stops and says let's go let's go through the river and the river now is to his ankles so then he's, they go down another thousand cubics fifteen hundred feet five hundred yards and we cross the river again and now the water came up to my knees Again, he measured 1,000, so now we're the, another 1,500 feet, and the water brought me up, the water came up to my waist. And then he measured one more 1,000. So each time we're going further from the source of origin, the deeper and wider or bigger the water, you know, height of the water is increasing. So he measures 1,000, and it was a river. Now, 1,000 times four is 4,000 cubics, 1,500 times uh, four is 6,000 feet. That's a mile. So, he, so just a mile journey, and now, the, now it's just you can't even cross it. You, you'd have to swim. <laughs> now, that, that's a good imagery because so many times the beginning points of God's transitional change is from within, and they're small in, in its inkling and and it's but it's it has the potential of releasing much 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 more now what about the river he said to me son of man have you seen this and he then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river and when i returned there along the bank of the river there were many trees on one side and the other same thing in revelation 22 then he said to me uh, this water flows toward the eastern region goes down into the valley and enters the sea. That's probably the Dead Sea, the current today, Israel's topography. And when it reaches the sea, it waters are healed. The sea's water. And the Dead Sea is dead. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river go, will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. So this river of life um, substance is, is to bring life. Wherever the river goes, it brings life. It shall be that fishermen will stand um, from En Gedi to En Glam, En Glam, and they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. And the only difference between a, a swamp and a marsh and a river is a swamp or a marsh has no outlet. It's, it's shallowed water that 
is stagnant water and it doesn't have the, you know, the kind of same flow. So there was something about the, the flow of, of the water important. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their waters flow from the sanctuary. Their f because their water, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. We see that too in Revelation 22. So the water is causing fruit, life, medicine, health. Thus says the Lord, these are the borders by which you... And no, we'll stop there. So this is an imagery that Jesus chose when he was in John 7 and said, there's coming out of our bellies, come drink this river of life and drink freely. And those who believe will, out of their bellies will flow the river's living water. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. So this is a, a similitude and a picture of Holy Spirit's movement of what he accomplishes, what he brings, what he does. So if you go with me to Romans 8, and I just kind of link to two pictures that are common, and then we'll do a little more praying as we close up. If you were to take Romans 8 and beginning... In verses 12 through 17, we talk about the new birth and the Spirit of God coming and giving us the Abba anointing, and, and there's an awareness that we're sons. And then it talks about we're going to journey with Jesus, and that journey is going to be, have some suffering in it, but if we will walk with him in that, we'll also be glorified within him there. And then it, he continues on, and it says it's not just... This is not just for our sake, but it's for creation's sake. Creation itself had been placed into this position of futility, not willingly, but because God had linked its destiny to ours. And our redemption would give creation a better destiny than it had before the fall. So we had cre creation somehow knows that and is aware that, and therefore it's groaning. And it's travailing. It has an earth, and there's three words that are seen throughout that. There's one about hope, there's one about groaning, and there's one about an expectation. It's about I'm looking for um, uh, groans, labors, re for redemption. So, so there's just creations waiting for this. And at the same time, then it goes on and says we believers carry that same, even though we have. Uh, let's I'll tell, get you in the verse. Not, verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So of all of the new creation, we are the ones who carry the most of Holy Spirit. The earth is still waiting for the effect of what we carry to reach it. So Holy Spirit, we're carrying the Holy Spirit. And it says, even though we have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? So it is God's design that salvation carries a mass of hope that is yet to be realized. So there's always something we're stretching toward. So as old as we are, we can be 90 years old and we're still stretching to that thing right before us that's yet to be seen. And in it, will come earnest expectation. It will come groanings because there's something about we don't know really how to get that, to that place. And we, get, we need that place to get to us. So the creation's groaning and we're groaning because we know that there's so much more that's going to happen to us just when we get our bodies redeemed. That's just going to be awesome. But if, so then he says, so what, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So there's that, okay, there's, it's coming. Now, likewise, now here's where I want to kind of, let's just look at Holy Spirit and possibly consider, i just be honest, just give you some heads up of how he operates or seems to be to me. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, which is infirmities, our malady, our feebleness, our inability to produce results, our our, our place we're at. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Now, most time we'll quote that, we don't know how to pray. But it doesn't say we don't know how to pray. We know how to pray here at Jubilee. You know how to pray. 
but we don't know what to pray. We don't know what to pray for. We just, as exact, because we're, we have limited sight and insight. We have a limited vantage point. We don't know exactly, is this sent to kill me or is this sent to deliver many? You know, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Spirit of God's groaning. Creation's groaning, we the redeemed are groaning, and the Spirit's groaning. And moving toward a direction. That's why Diana sung, I, when she sang it on Sunday, and there's that one uh, instrumental you know, interlude, it just lent itself to groaning. And it wasn't the groaning of, oh, God, I'm, I'm so having such a hard time dying. Because I think the gro- <laughs> it is hard to die. We know that, right? I think it's I'm groaning because I'm reaching out to that redemption. I'm reaching out to touch that resurrection. I'm reaching out for that resurrection to come forth. In any case, here we have Holy Spirit making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered which is anything from tongues, inarticulate speech, to groanings, where it's just kind of a guttural, I don't know how to express what I feel, but I just, ah. And sometimes that's in pleasure, and sometimes that is in distress. Think of having a baby, or trying to get through the last set of your workout. Ah. You know, we'll do things, you know, a little Noah, and I'll be climbing up a little hill in the park and it's hard for me because I don't do this all the time and I'll go ah just to get myself up on the over the top seems to feel good and so he'll come and follow me and do the exact same thing he doesn't need to do that but now he knows ah <laughs> we're playing with his little car his little uh, little teeny track uh, tractor and a little teeny dump truck and we were getting rocks and putting the d- rocks into the uh, dump truck, and so because they, they got bigger and bigger, the boulders, I would go, <clears throat> trying to, you know, in my mind, imagine this is a rock five times the size of this tractor, so it would be impossible to really happen, but we're, we're pretending, and so later on yesterday, I said, hey, tell your mom what we did at the park, uh, tell them about the boulders, and so he's going, <clears throat> So, <laughs> don't know. a lot of our gro- learning sound and learning how to pray isn't so much that we have to get the right words. We're just learning to mimic what God wants us to be mimicking or learning to do, right? And that's Holy Spirit's groaning, earth's groaning, we're groaning, we're moving towards something. What are we moving toward? Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So Holy Spirit knows, he knows, he came to reveal Jesus. He knows who we are. He knows who we are in Christ. And he knows the will of God for us at this current moment in our journey toward perfection. So he's full of clarity and, and capacity. And so he knows how to pray when we don't know what to pray. And his sound is moving us toward that will of God. Even if it's far away from our mind, we can't grasp what's going, we can't see the purpose where we're at, he's got a plan and he's moving us there. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called, the called according to his purpose. So the Holy Spirit is, I mean, if I've been trying to renew my, my relationship with him as a person and how he carries himself. And as a person, he carries himself into this equation of, of redemption as the one who administrates all that has been accomplished through Jesus Christ. He has all of Jesus' authority to do with all the power that he's carrying to accomplish it. So he can literally bring anything to pass. He can heal us in an instant. He can free our mind in a moment. He can cause us to go from sorrow to joy in a split second. He can, he can arrest us in our pursuit of hell and, and call us to our destiny. He, he's just very capable and has great power. But when he's with, as he awakens in us, 
he doesn't do it in such a dramatic fashion, it seems to me, that just radically just moves us from where we were to where we are to be, and we don't even know how we got there. It seems to me that when he begins to move, he starts to just, as it says in uh, the picture in, re in the new creation or the recreation of the earth in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, that he comes and he broods. Brooding is, another word for it is to hover. Another Greek word is, or Hebrew word is to relax into. So picture our life corporately or individually or just start with yourself. And Holy Spirit is aware that we're about, we're ready for movement. We're ready to move toward everything we've been currently in to go into the good column. Something transforming so it comes in line with what was already predestined for us to become conformed to. Because God knew us in, before the foundation of the world and predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So that's, Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. Our life looks like total chaos, but he knows exactly what he, where we're going. So now he starts to move, and as he starts to move, it's like the beginning of the water at the altar. It's the beginning of the trickles. It's the beginning of wetting the soil and releasing. And for me, what I've noticed with the Holy Spirit is that he comes in and he begins to relax into my mess. He doesn't quickly clean it up. And because he's actually, we've been trying to quickly clean it up. And we've put things in boxes and stuffed boxes in closets. And we've tidied up as best we can and put stuff under the rug. And we've just tried to maintain as best we can. And now he starts settling in for a, a new new season of prayer or season of manifestation, a season of groaning, season of movement. And he comes like a small little water and he begins to soften the soil and, and begin to move in our heart. And he touches things that are not what we were planning for him to touch. Right? He doesn't come, you would think, I would think that he comes now to empower me to just do 10 times better than what I was doing before he showed up. But in all of my journey with Jesus, he comes basically to undo me 10 times worse than I was before he showed up. Because the four I've just found is that I don't change when I'm like this. I had this picture of the Holy Spirit being like, we go through... You know, if you've ever been focused for a season trying to, to do and grow and observe and do all the pr proper things, you might consider yourself at the end, I know I do like this. Am I doing it all right? Am I, you know, I'm just really focused, you know, really sitting and tight and um, just, you know, really wanting to not make any more mistakes than I've already made. And I'm just really like that. And then... When the Holy Spirit comes in and he sits down next to me, he's kind of more like this. Ah, oh, man. Ah. Oh. Whoa. Yeah. And he goes and sits in the wrong seat, first off. Not the one I would have chose for him to sit in. You know, I want the seat over here. He's over in that seat, you know. And then he's, when he sits himself down, it's not that he's like, Ooh, it smells funny here. Or, why are you guys so tight? Or, it's almost because he's not self-conscious, he's God-conscious. So he's only conscious of what he's come for. And he's only conscious of the one he's come to magnify, which is Jesus. And all that we are is kind of just, uh, it's a temporary setting that we're in anyway. So he's not even concerned about it, like we might be. And then if he starts to relax... And we begin to get, okay, a little bit comfortable that, wow, he seems to be here and he just seems to be kind of getting bigger. But now he, he gets up out of my chair and he says, hey, what's that box over there? Oh, not that box. It, you can look at any box, but don't look at the mission and alms box. <laughs> I'm not ready to go there. Oh, why not? He goes out of order, touches stuff I didn't want to deal with and stirs me up. So if you're feeling a fluttering of emotions, a disconcerting, disconcertingness, disconcertedness about your present posture, how you've been holding yourself, 
how you've been trying to, you know, stay in agreement with God and His Word, and things are kind of all of a sudden like, whoa, that's a whole different way of looking at that. But again, it's not just, let's go positive. Because if I know anything about me, is while I've been trying to go positive, I've been stuffing the negative. I haven't been resolving the negative. I've just been trying to go positive. So all of a sudden, he comes and says, yeah, we're going positive, but let's, talk, let's start with the negative. And you're going, you don't want to go with the negative. That's, he goes, you don't understand. I make beauty from ashes. I need the negative. I need your junk. I need where you're not together. And so, I don't know, you know, it wasn't from Thursday when I just had that, for me, a real personal encounter. But all of a sudden, it's like, it's like bringing your, a friend of yours home, and then he just like, starts taking over your home. So it's, you know, sitting, changing seats, moving furniture. Hey, what's in this box? No, not that box. Well, what way? What are you? Oh, I see that. And pull, pulling feelings and opening emotions, and now I'm sorting out. Wow. I ta- you know how long it's taken me not to have that feeling? What are you doing letting that feeling show up? I've spent five years ke- keeping that feeling in that box, and you just touched that feeling. What are you doing? You know, it's just disruptive. He's, 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 see, because think about this. This, cha- this chaos that was on the planet was without form. That means it was literally ex- an, an annihilated scenery. And it was with void, meaning it was empty of life and uninhabitable. And that darkness, which is everything from darkness to misery to ignorance to sickness, was sitting on inside of, on top of the abyss of the water. Think black hole of the universe. And Holy Spirit comes, and he's not like going, okay, Jesus, if I touch it long enough, can you then speak something over it? He's just coming in and just kind of going, he makes darkness his canopy. He makes his home, he can make his home in hell if he, when he, you know, there's no escaping God and no intimidating God. So he settles into it. How long? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how long Holy Spirit brooded, rested, relaxed into chaos until God said, light, come forth. Yeah. It might have been frac- it w- seconds, it could have been weeks, months. What I've learned about Holy Spirit is he's not anxious. And he doesn't seem to be on a time schedule. We've got to get this done in a certain amount of time. He's just settling in. And while he's settling in, all of that chaos, I believe, starts being impacted by the the presence. Because God's going to call light out of darkness. He's going to call it out of a place that it doesn't come from. But because the power of the Holy Spirit will have taken the darkness and turned it into light like he turns, takes ashes and turns into beauty. So while we are in this invitation, while we're looking for the, the triumphant voice, don't be afraid of hearing the defeated sound of your soul. If we really want the triumphant voice of Jesus, then there's going to be some honest conversations with, I feel like, the defeated, you know, Gadaridiac, Gadarene demoniac kid. I'm driven in... I have, no, I have no connectivity. I'm, I'm so far from that sense of it's all in place and all in order. See, because God isn't trying to get us to, you know, just agree with him so that he can just get us to the next place. He's trying to liberate us from the lies that we're living in, the sounds we've been carrying, the shame that's been placed on us, the accusations, the fear. All of those things are going to be, gets addressed. Now, I can get to the point where where it's no longer the trickle and the ankle, and it's no longer the knee, and it's no longer the waist. It just becomes a river, and everything that goes in, it just gets swept up. But it starts somewhere. It starts at the altar. It starts at the t- in, the, in, the, in the belly. It starts in the, in the, at, the mo- at the point we currently are. And it, if it's happening to you, yeah, you can be afraid, because I don't know how not to be afraid. You feel vulnerable more than you were. You feel more naked. You feel more like, I don't know if, I, what, you know, my resources that I've been using aren't, aren't as, you know, my, my stamina, my, my, my capacity to see it in the right way. Let's get up and run. All that just seems to be deflating. 
yet I feel the presence of God and he's coming and that's let him touch it you have no choice anyway you either dysfunction and go okay Holy Spirit you're no help get out of here I'm going back to fixing this by my flesh or we just kind of go well Holy Spirit bring life let life begin to touch what you're touching let healing begin to touch what you're healing have real honest conversations with God so that there's an opening so that it can touch the, the very all the separate entities and you know like if we're just all tied up he's going to kind of open us up like a big fan and find ways inside all these little places because he wants to bring life he wants to bring health he wants to heal so if we can stay engaged in Holy Spirit whatever he's touching is good because he turns he brings all things to good because he knows where we're headed and he knows that all things in Christ are good and even as creation ended by God saying and the first day was over and God saw the light and God saw that it was good he's going to look at every one of us and say and he looked at Brian and God saw that Brian was good he looked at Veda and he saw that what he had done in Veda was good every one of us no matter what journey we've come through what part of life is yet to be redeemed God will look upon us and through his son and by what he accomplished he will say that is really good and we have to we have to we have to let that truth hold us when God starts to try to dis to dismantle something that's currently been in place so that he can bring something that is to be in place so can you stand with me please you, you guys carry life. You carry history with God. You carry tr promise. You carry truth. You also carry great testing. I know many of you have been through awful testings. We've all had that contending over our destiny. And now I also know that there's just something of God's heavenly kindness that's saying, I, wanna, I don't want to just fix your life. I want to heal your life. I want to bring resolution and, and redemption to seasons. So, Holy Spirit, we give you permission, the best we know how, to, to continue to access our life, to touch our souls, to move in our journey, not in any fashion where there would just be renewed overwhelming of emotions that we can't function in, or we become uh, distraught by or accusations that rise up again and they lie to us and we just surrender to the fact that we cannot never will see change no we begin with the fact that you will cause all things to work together for good so any touching of any area of any of our lives right now is with the intent purpose stated purpose of God to move us to conformity to resurrection so Lord we want that we want resurrection life we want to be conformed to the firstborn from many of many brethren. So, Lord, we, we say you can touch us and we will hold that truth, that you will bring us to the other side, to the outcome, to the, to the body you've chosen to give each of us, to living that place of victory. So, Holy Spirit, come and fill and touch and grow and groan. <laughs> and give us language and connectivity and freedom and permission and Lord God we want we, we accept that we have a wimpy voice so that we might receive your triumphant voice we're not trying to impress you with our shouting we rather hear the shout of God and to rise up in triumph so Lord please come upon us watch over the whole body watch over everyone on the internet every, every one of us as we move especially in these next two weeks as we just continue to surrender and yield ourselves to you acknowledging what you've accomplished and acknowledging you are working to bring about the, the completion of what Jesus finished we give you praise and glory for that in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen, amen. thank you so much we agree we agree. Let it be, Lord. Amen. Thank you.